All right, welcome back. This is a lecture on ancient China. And what I have here is a fairly long timeline of some things we're going to cover this week. So starting with the Neolithic as usual and moving right on down to the Tang Dynasty. Um, some of these um, dynasties won't be covered in this particular video, so make sure you look at the syllabus to figure out what uh, you need to do if it's not on the video. What you're looking at here is a map of China, and I want to start off looking at two Neolithic villages, Jiahu and Banpo. So you can just follow the arrows here to see where these are. Okay, let's start looking at Jiahu. So I've given you the dates here of when it was settled, around 7,000 to about 6,000 BC. Um, it's an interesting Neolithic village because what you find are three separate living areas. There's three separate areas that people were using. So you've got where their houses were, where they were living. You've got places where they seem to go off and do work, like making pottery and so on. And you also have a place for the dead to be buried, which is a cemetery. Now this is different than what we looked at well, with Chetul Hyuk. If you look at some of the archaeological material coming out of Jiahu, you see that they were definitely in the Neolithic, or they were farming, because you find evidence of rice, millet, um, domesticated animals. And one thing you should be asking yourself is, how do we know this? So we know this based on archaeological material. So archaeologists, archaeologists come in, they do soil samples, and find bits of bone or bits of, bits of plant material. Here you've got some material taken from some of the grave sites, and these are turtle shells, and down to the bottom right, you've got a pile of stones. Now what I want you to do is to turn the video off and to think about what these two are doing together. Why are there turtle shells and why are there bones, or sorry, why are there uh, stones in the same grave site? And um, we don't know the answer to that particular question, but a good guess is that it has something to do with music. So people could have put those stones within the turtle shells and then shaken it like a rattle. And the reason I want to talk about that is because in the next slide I'm going to show you a real musical instrument, which is a flute, which was created at Jiahu even from the earliest periods of this, this particular site. And here you have the flutes. So these flutes are found in all la layers of Jiahu, Jiahu 1, 2, and 3, and these are made out of red crane bones. And what's really fascinating about this is, of course, they have music for one thing, um, but in one, one of the areas you find two flutes that were ni uh, right next to each other. One was fully formed, and one it's clear that they were working on it. And just the other day I was going through some of my uh, Scoop It pages, and they've just discovered another one of these flutes. And this is um, in early November 2013, where they actually found more of these flutes. Here is um, some images of some grave sites from Jiahu. And if you just look at the left one, what you can see is a body uh, laying on its back, so face up, toes up. And then you've got a grave good or a jar that's right by the head. Then you've got this interesting grave site to the right, which is two people buried on top of each other. Um, and there is a pot there. Now what I want you to do is to turn off the video and to think about why you'd have two people buried on top of each other. So again, it, we don't know the right answer to this, or we don't know the answer to this. But there is something in Chinese history called marriage burials, where if a man had gone through his entire life and not got married, when he dies, what they do is they would sacrifice a woman and then bury her in the grave with him so that when he woke up in the afterlife, he would be married. Now, the, another thing to note about this is that jar at the top. Now, I would just want to tell you a little bit about the jars in general. So when archaeologists went through this site, they opened up these jars and they smelled sort of alcoholic. So what they did was they took swipes and it turns out that the contents were definitely alcoholic and they were made out of 
um, a type of rice, rice wine, so almost like sake, but people call it rice beer today. And this image is just showing you um, the archaeological site of one of the cemeteries. And then next what I want to do is look at the archaeological site of Banpo. What you're looking at here on this picture is um, part of a house from Banpo. And what I want you to concentrate on, concentrate on are those little circles that sort of dot the entire area. And what these are, that the, the ancient Chinese people built their houses, they dug holes, and then they put wooden posts in to hold up the walls. All right, now just some information about Banpo. So if you look at the differences you find, or between Banpo and Jiahu, you find that the principal crop was millet. Now millet is a, another type of um, grain that was wild and then domesticated. And you don't find too much rice here. Now no big surprise, you do find agricultural tools. So we are in the Neolithic and people are farming. Another interesting part about this site is the use of silk. So very early on, the Chinese are developing silk, which of course becomes much more important later on. Now we've talked about the fact that at um, Jiahu you've got cemetery where people are buried um, outside of the living areas. Same here with Banpo. You've got adults buried in a cemetery. Um, you also have, though which is different, children uh, being buried within the house. So these um, children when they die are sort of folded up. They're put into pottery jars and they're buried either right inside the door or right outside of the door. And in fact, one of the most um, spectacular burials found at Pampo so far was the body of a child in one of these pots with a large amount of grave goods. And on this image, you've got some pottery that's being dug out of the ground. And if you're really lucky, you get pottery like at the upper uh, center of this, this scene where it comes out whole. So you have to be very careful while you're digging around this. Um, usually, though, you've got some something like the pot that's shown down at the bottom where it's all broken up. And if you could see a close-up of this, there's lots of little chips down at the bottom, which undoubtedly are parts of these pots. Now let's move on to the next period of time which may in fact not be an actual um, real time period. It's called the Three Sovereigns and the Five Emperors and most of the information we have about this particular um, point in Chinese history comes from a historian named Sima Chen who lived between 145 and 90 BC and wrote um, a pretty incredible book called The Records of the Grand Historian. So what he tells us is that um, most of the, the material that the Chinese have at that period of time in the first century BC was developed in, in, in an ancient period and many Chinese believe that it was developed by someone named um, Huangdi or the Yellow Lord. Now I put a whole list of things here that he supposedly invented for the Chinese people. So things like agriculture, the calendar, uh, carts and boats. Um, this is fairly typical for ancient people to do. So they're living in a civilization, they've got all this material, and they're wondering where exactly they got it. So they sometimes look to um, ancient people who may, have, may or may not have been real. Moving on to the next time period, this is called the Chia Dynasty. And I've given dates here to it last till about 1570. And if we had been taking this class a few years ago, there wouldn't have been very much we could say about it. In fact, some people didn't even think it was a real dynasty. But more people have been doing archaeological um, investigations in China and have discovered that the Chia Dynasty is one of the earliest recorded dynasties we have 
in China. Um, it's still the case that we don't know very much about them. More and more information is coming out. We do know that they use bronze, and this is coming from um, archaeology. And again, we also know that they had horses. So horses were at least used in China as early as you know 20 uh, or 2000 BC. It might have been a little bit earlier, but this is one of the earliest time points we have for evidence of horses. Let's move on now to the dynasty, the, the earliest dynasty that we actually know quite a bit about, and this is the Shang Dynasty, which lasts from about 1570 to about 1000 BC. And on the map that you're looking at, it shows some of the territory that they controlled. And I'll show you in the next slide um, the, the extent of their um, holdings. But what the map is showing is, is some of the, the major urban areas that were controlled by the Shang. And the capital here is Anyang during this period. And here's another map of China showing you the extent of the Shang and what you want to look for is the light brown with the, which is within the darker green uh, which is the extent of China today. I put this in here because what it's showing you is how difficult it can be sometimes to do archaeology especially when you've got a large population like China. So what you're looking at is on the left you've got agricultural fields and on the right people are doing archaeology and no doubt under those archaeological fields you've got or under those agricultural fields you've got archaeological material. We know quite a bit about the Shang period primarily because of this particular tomb, which is a tomb of a queen named Lady Hao, and her tomb was discovered at Anyang, and if you remember that is the capital. Um, we have other tombs of Shang kings, but unfortunately they've all been tomb robbed. Now hers wasn't. So when it was discovered, it turns out it had never been opened since her death in about 1200 uh, BC. And what you're looking at is the actual uh, burial pit. So right in the center of this, that dark square was where her body was laid and there, there were layers and layers of material buried on top of her. Um, if you can take a close-up of this what you'll see is that she was when she died they sacrificed 16 people so around the edge of this pit and I have a slide here next which is, shows a little better um, 16 people were sacrificed. They also found five dogs within her tomb and it's thought that she was definitely a, a hunter and that she used these in her hunting. And they also find material um, that's related to horses. So she definitely rode horses, had dogs, and the people who were sacrificed with her were probably her um, household staff. Here's a much better shot showing the, uh, the bottom part of her tomb and off to the left and right in the bright lights you can see the bodies there. Um, within her tomb they found, as I said, a ton of material including um, lots of bronze works. They also found about 7,000 shells and I've asked you to watch a small short minute, or sorry, 10 minute uh, video on Lady Howe. So you can stop at any point and watch that or you can wait till after this lecture is over. This is just showing you a statue of Lady Hao at her tomb. Here you have a few slides on the material found in Lady Hao's tomb. This is almost like a ceremonial sink. And in the next scene, you will see a bronze vase. What you're looking at here did not come from Lady Hao's tomb, but it was found by one of the Shang King's tombs. And what you can see, and it's clearly seen, is that it's a chariot. So you can see the wheel down at the bottom. You can also see the two horses. So when the king died, they sacrificed the horses. You can also see a body down to your lower left, which must have been one of the chariot drivers. And if you look up to the upper right, you can see the legs and part of the, the pelvis of 
another person. So when the king died, he had his chariot buried, he sacrificed the horses, and sacrificed the two uh, chariot drivers. One of the reasons why we know so much about the Shang period is because they had writing. And what you're looking at here is something called an oracle bone. So they were either, uh, either uh, uh, turtle shells or a deer scapula. And then what the Chinese did is they wrote questions on them. And once they asked their questions, they tossed these things into the fire and then they cracked. And then a priest would come along, read the cracks, much like what happens today with your palm being read and then can tell the future. So in the next um, scene, what I have is one that's asking if it will rain today, uh, which is an important question, especially if you are thinking about doing something in terms of military. You don't want your military getting bogged down in a bunch of muck if it's going to rain. Let's talk a little bit about what we know of the government during the Shang period. So there was definitely a king, or some people call him an emperor, really the uh, emperors don't start until the Qin period, which we'll talk about. You've got a weak centralized state, meaning these kings are not strong, or not very strong, to at least control the outer areas. Um, we know that they had some type of administrative hierarchy, meaning um, administrators. So you've got um, the king at the top, then you've got the people who can read and write, who are taking care of the economy and the government and so on, and then everyone down below. Now, we also know that the government was set up um, as a dynasty, and what that means is, and we've looked at this before, you've got father, son, father, son, or father to another male, male relative. They also collected taxes during this time, and with those taxes, they created infrastructure or what I have up here is public work. So infrastructure could be bridges, uh, public buildings, and so on. And then finally, I didn't really need to put this up here on the scene, but down at the bottom of the social hierarchy are the peasants, or the people who are doing most of the physical labor during this period. And just a little bit about the religion from the Shang period. Again, we get most of this information from the writing from the Oracle Bones. We know that their main god was called Shang Ti, and that they had other sort of nature gods, like God of the Earth, God of the Rain. Um, as we've seen, you definitely have human sacrifice being practiced. Now, this stops soon after this period, but you can see from Lady Howe's tomb, there are definitely people who were killed when these important people um, die. You also have animal sacrifice. You've seen that with the chariots. Um, divinations, what that means is people looked at the oracle bones and tried to tell the future. You also have something called ancestor worship, which plays a really big part in Chinese culture even today. And it originally started off with people worshiping the emperor, and then it was moved down into the family structure. And then when someone dies, there's usually sort of an anniversary where people will bring food to the tombs. And this is fairly common in the ancient world. You see this with early Christians. They do the exact same thing. And then we know that there were priests. So priests who were reading the oracle bones and priests who were handling all the other religious um, material. We also know a bit about Tang technology. I've, also, I've already showed you some of the bronze working, so they were definitely known for being great bronze workers, which they made lots of different things, um, decoration, they used, made weapons, made other tools. Um, you already know that they had horses and chariots, and we know that from the archeological record. And one thing we haven't talked about yet is the development of a calendar. And they used a lunar calendar. So what that means is they, they mark time by the phases of the moon. And if you've ever thought about a lunar calendar, um, you know that it's not the same length as a solar calendar, or one based on the sun. So a lunar year is much shorter. And 
they knew that there was a problem with this. And the problem is that with a lunar calendar, you can have, um, say, physical spring on the planet and have the calendar stay at spring. But because the lunar year is shorter, the next year, spring on the calendar is going to be earlier than the actual spring on the planet. And over a number of decades, you could have spring on the calendar, but it could be the middle of winter. So what the Chinese ended up doing is adding extra days, and it's essentially what we do with a leap year. So we add one day every four years to make sure the calendar doesn't get off. And just a bit about the economy. I had mentioned previously that during the Neolithic period, you definitely have a millet being grown. So millet was a very important crop for the Shang. Um, a big part of the economy, too, was sending tribute to the king. And most of the tribute were, were bones, not, not surprisingly, the bones that they were then used to write the material on to tell the future. Um, shells might have been a big, big part of the economy as well. So we're not talking about a coin economy just yet. But as I mentioned in Lady Howe's tomb, you've got over 7,000 um, seashells found. And this is the case in other uh, Shang tombs. And we also know that people were put to work in large, large numbers to build um, various buildings. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, we talked about the definition of a civilization, which is monumental architecture. So you need a lot of people um, put to work to build these very large buildings. And last thing we'll talk about in terms of the Shang is their end. So all dynasties come to an end, all civilizations come to an end. The Shang were defeated around 1045, or around 1000 BC, um, by another group of Chinese people called the Zhao. And the Zhao were coming from the north and the west and moving eastwards, and eventually took over the Shang. And what I want you to do to learn about the, uh, the uh, Zhao and the Qin and the Han is to look at the slides that I have up on um, uh, Blackboard and then do the exercises there.